Wake up, wake up. It is 1 p.m. Sunday. This thing's wrapping up, but we still have plenty of things to do this weekend. So, without further ado, you guys are here to see the Texas Chainsaw Massacre reunion. Yeah. All right, let's get things started. First off, let's have Marilyn Burns. Just have a seat. Uh, <laughs> Where are you, Gunnar Hansen! Good job, everybody! And of course, it's, it's Terry Finch. Edwin Neal! So feel free to grab, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna have fun, guys. You guys having a good weekend so far? Can I get a malted? What's that? <laughs> Can I get a malted? A malted? <laughs> I need a malted. Is this the Rolling Steam bar that's what I'm supposed to say? <laughs> oh. <laughs> this is Spooky Empire's oh, yeah. ultimate oh, hunter. <laughs> <laughs> It's it's a pleasure to have all you guys here. It really is. I mean, this yeah, is good to be anywhere. I, <laughs> Gunner, you, you you know been here many times, and it's always a pleasure to have you. And Ed, you were actually at the very first. I was at the first where there were two dealers and four guests, and like three tables, <laughs> three tables, like three tables, back of a Seven Eleven over by the lake. It was. <laughs> <laughs> and the kids are good, huh? Absolutely. You got your, let's give it for let's give it up for Petey. Come on, come on, guys. I mean, Gunner knows and Ed knows, I mean, you guys are here from the beginning and you've seen this thing just blow up and get bigger every year. It's, it's un unbelievable the way this thing is just like, keeps getting bigger and growing and growing and, and again, it's always great to have you, Gunner, and I'm glad that everyone was able to make it out this time. It's a virgin experience. <laughs> I had one of those in the late 50s. <laughs> <laughs> so, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. This is a movie that, you know, times have changed. Years have gone by. Movies have changed. The gore that we see in these films nowadays, it's, it's over the top, and the, and the violence that we see is over the top. But it's amazing to me that after all these years and after everything that's gone by, that Texas Chainsaw Massacre still has the impact and, and, and offers the scares that it does after all these years. You know, wouldn't you guys agree to that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it truly is still a really exciting movie to see after all these years. Hey, it's okay. It's okay. I'm Buck Clint. <laughs> <laughs> to, to me, I think it's uh, that there is very little gore. You know, in, in the movie, yeah, and uh, the believability is what I think. It's all up to the imagination. That uh, we really weren't acting, and we weren't actors, which is 
which is very true, especially in my case. Uh, so I think that's what holds up after all these years, you know, that, um, that people love this movie. And this makes me feel good, this is almost 40 years later, and have an audience like this. It's, it's thrilling, and it's because of you guys, so you deserve a lot of the credit. Thank you. Now, we have all you guys here, and we, we want to know all the stories and all the... <laughs> well, we're going to need some sandwiches and some queer. <laughs> and I just, a lot of stories. I just have to say, before we, we, we keep going, is, is you, my friend, are quite the dancer. <laughs> yeah, no, and for fun. any of us who were at the VIP party last night, I had the pleasure of seeing Mr. Neil here shake his tushy. I appreciate the find the stuff in my belt, but hey, you know, that's if I had more, I would have given it. Uh, that's my day job, okay? <laughs> so, anyways, we've got a room full of people, and we've got uh, volunteers out there with microphones who are, you know, willing to bring them up to you, and if you guys have any questions whatsoever regarding the movie, the actors, or anything involving what's going on here, please raise your hand, we'll have a microphone brought to you, stand up so we can see where you are, because these lights are a little intense, and uh, speak clearly. We have someone here in the front row who has a question. Um, the whole movie is, is very frightening, but when... Um, the most frightening part to me, and I, and I don't know um, what the most frightening part to you guys is in the movie, and that's mainly what my question is, but to me it was um, the death of um, when um, she got hung on the hook. That was the, <laughs> yeah, yeah, just the thought of, of you hanging there watching your boyfriend be dismantled with a chainsaw, I just thought that was frightening. <laughs> It was frightening, and it was painful. You're so correct, the scar is terrible. <laughs> I was hoping it would heal one day. It will if those Brazilian boys keep rubbing the cocoa butter like that. <laughs> yeah, uh, the day before we were going to shoot that scene, Toby came over to me and he said, Well, Terry? said, uh, what do you what do you think uh, what do you think we'll we gotta do? What are you thinking of doing uh, about the meat hook scene? You know, I was like, well, you know, Toby, I have thought about it a lot, and I was thinking that if she wasn't pierced in a strategic point like on her spine, that I would try and get off. And he said. Well, yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> so that was what we did, and um, it was actually one of the easier scenes. It didn't take that long. Um, they were very kind to me. I wore uh, a very embarrassing costume underneath my costume, and it was made of parachute strapping and a steel hook. And so when a Gunner is going to hang me on the hook, Toby was beneath me, and uh, we have that one part where I almost get away from it, which I think is really powerful because you think, oh, good, you know, she's going to get away. But that was actually strategic so that I would be turned facing the camera, and then you see the bare back coming up to the hook, and then the editing is so good, then you see me falling. Well, what happened is, there was a strap that came up the back off of this uh, contraption that I had on underneath my costume. And uh, that hook, Toby was spotting me and the hook had to go right, uh, the loop had to go right onto the hook, exactly. And that's when Gunner, you know, let me go. And, I, and it was really rough because the first time I actually, my back actually was pierced by the hook. So that was rugged. But then the second time we got it right, and we, uh, <laughs> and that was it. But it was very powerful, and the crew, everybody was standing around, and they were just, it was quiet, nobody said a word. So it, it was, uh, we thought we had it, but you know, we never saw dailies, so we didn't know what's going on now. 
No, I just wanted to add that uh, for the close-up, when they were actually doing it, and I was one of the, the group of people standing around, it was uh, very frightening, and it, it made you sick. Terry did such a good job of, uh, you know, being impaled. <laughs> the most uh, frightening bit for me was when the uh, director said, okay, we're going to run that again. I didn't want to run again. <laughs> yeah, we were all trying to get off, Terry. <laughs> <laughs> the most funny thing for me when I watch the movie is cutting out the bill. And the reason doesn't have anything to do with what I'm, what's, you know, getting caught up in the story or in the, in the film. It's because only after did we shot Chainsaw did I come to learn how dangerous the saw is. The winter after Chainsaw came out, a, a year after Chainsaw came out, I moved to New England and heated my house with wood, which meant for the first time, for the second time in my life, I used the chainsaw. Uh, I had never handled a chainsaw before, chainsaw ice cream. And I had no clue how dangerous that saw was. Uh, and when we're cutting, when I'm cutting on Bill, I told Bill to uh, just to lie still and that I would control the saw. So if he got hit with wood chips, he was okay as long as he didn't move. I'd make sure the saw didn't hit him. And I didn't understand until later that when a saw box, you don't control it. It goes where it wants to. And if the saw boxed, the chain on that saw on the bar was only, what, six or eight inches from, from, his, from his head. If the saw boxed, it would have killed him. So that's the scariest thing for me to watch. Not because of what's going on in the narrative, but knowing what was going on. <laughs> It, it was scary at the time for me, too, and, and without even knowing that, because I was laying there. I couldn't, I couldn't move, and all I could feel was... Don't tell Kirk! Splinters, and the, the oil coming off of the blade, and I could feel all that in my face. And they had a person, Spot Dottie Curl, was down watching to make sure I didn't breathe or move or flinch or anything. Really that was a scene we could not wait to finish. Yes. That, yes. that was the, there was nothing painful about hanging on the hook or any of the stuff. They were very kind. But that took a while to get that part of it. And that was, we couldn't wait. Just the sound of it in that little tiny room. And, you know, it, it was very tense. I remember that. We have someone back here with a question? Uh, yes, hello. I was at, what I want to know is, what did you think of the 03 remake and what did you think of Texas Chainsaw 3D? Personally, I liked the 03 remake. I think Arlie or Ermey added another element of horror. As for 3D, they had a good idea, but I think they kind of failed on execution. I think you're right, sir. I think Dallas will win today. <laughs> Essentially, to me, they missed the point, uh, and the, there are a lot of things I don't care for about the movie. But the thing that bothers me is they explain Leatherface away. He's a kid with a skin problem and an attitude, and once you explain him away, the level of fright in the character is just gone. And I think the reason Leatherface is, or one reason Leatherface is such a frightening character in the original is. He is unknown, and he's unknowable. There's, you don't know what's behind the mask, if anything. In, three, in the 2003 version, you know exactly what's behind the mask. It's a guy with, with diseased blackened skin and no nose. You know, it's like unmasking Darth Vader. It's a guy with wisdom, you know. It's much more frightening when, when he's just this voice. And, I think that that really dissipated the character. So I mean, that, anyway, that's what I did. 
You just got to understand that in Hollywood, if, if you have a movie about the birth of platypus puppies, <laughs> you know, and it makes money, you're going to get nine more movies about platypus puppies. <laughs> it's just the way it is. So the, those films really don't have nothing to do with us. You know, it's just part of a franchise to make money. So we, we, we go, well, we're not, it's not really us, it's something else. Yeah, someone over here. There you go. How you guys doing? Uh, the original film is my all-time favorite, and uh, my question is, for the victims of the movie, when you guys first saw Gunner in costume, what was your reaction? Because some of the scenes where you guys died seemed like you were horrified when you first saw him. Uh, Alan uh, especially sticks out like when Gunner comes out of the room, it was just like you seemed really terrified. So. Uh, I just want to know what were your guys' thoughts when you first saw him in the outfit? Well, my death scene, I think, really was the acting, because I had myself, you know, off in a corner. I had my eyes closed, and I really got worked up. So much so that when uh, I got into the scene and I started that scream, you know, I think Toby call, uh, called me aside and said, great scream, Alan, but you got to wait till he comes into the shop. <laughs> You know, and uh, I think they held me down the next, you know, was uh, by my belt loops. Because I took a shot from that, that mallet, and that's like 40 years ago, and I'm still getting headaches. <laughs> you know, so, but I honestly feel that that was really, because I had not seen Leatherface before, so really that was my gut reaction. I was still uh, Um... Gunner and I had to, uh, I had seen him a little bit because Gunner and I had to work out the whole death scene. Originally, it was very, very simple. I was just supposed to come in, trip on the ramp, he hit me, and that was it. And uh, I had heard a, an expression from Jimmy Cagney, who ought to know that no good actor dies quickly. And so I wanted, not only for myself as an actor, but also because of it's the first death of the movie, felt it should be very impactful and set people up for, oh my God, what's going to happen now? What's, where are we going from this point? And so I worked with Toby and took his idea and then added my flip to it. And then he said, okay, now uh, twitch on the floor on the ramp and then we put blood in, which I don't think most people realize that I was spitting blood as I was flipping through the air. And then Gunner and I the, did it, and the first time, he didn't want to hit me very hard, so when he swung, it was so lightly, I, I didn't, wasn't aware of it, and I just flipped. <laughs> and it was, the timing was off. So I said, look, Gunner, you got to really hit me, or I'm not going to know when to flip. And the governor accommodated me. <laughs> and even though it was a, a foam rubber head on the end of the hammer, he hauled off and knocked the crap out of me. <laughs> and, and broke all the blood vessels in my one eye. And that's the take of me. And then he picked me up, we went through the whole thing, picked me up, and then threw me in the corner of this very small little room. And he picked me up, he was pumped, <laughs> and he picked me up and threw me right into the corner. I remember smashing into the wall. Yeah, I was supposed to drop him on these pillows, and I just flipped him right over the pillows, right past the pillows, and he went headlong into the wall, and uh, then he crashed and landed quite comfortably. Says <laughs> you, I don't remember that one. <laughs> Well, that's one of the things that I think isn't, hasn't been talked about a lot, and I saw, I saw <coughs> Gunner reference it in his new book in the beginning about how he was so excited that he really kind of manhandled Bill because he'd been pumped up and fired up, you know. I thought my action of yanking poor Sally or Marilyn into the top of the cab when I pulled her up several times and just about, you know, flattened her head on top because I was so excited and heated up, you know, and overacting to the best of my ability, that, uh, <laughs> that uh, uh, it, uh, it, it, it could have caused some real injury. So, so the secret seems to be that everybody that acted in this thing in some way 
unbeknownst to you guys, actually got smacked, slapped, <laughs> cut, hooked, thrown. <laughs> Next. <laughs> Marilyn, you had an incident in your All of those. All of those. Yeah, yeah, I was talking about Marilyn. Actually. Yeah, I, I think that, that film does bring back lots and lots of memories of uh, near death. Continually. <laughs> <laughs> What about, about three years ago, I was sitting on stage with Gunner, we were having another question and answer. And I'm telling the story of how they accidentally cut my finger. Now really, I just found this out three years ago. But I did. And Gunner goes, oh, Marilyn, give it up. And I'm looking at him like I would look at him right now across stage going, you're going to do it. And he goes, Marilyn, Works. We just decided to go ahead and cut you. <laughs> now, now you know why that looks so real. <laughs> and now you know why I waited so long to tell you. <laughs> yes! I was so upset, but I, what can I do? A statute of limitations. <laughs> One thing I also remember that I don't think anyone's brought up in a question and answer. I happen to be thinking of this. Well, you know, back, we didn't have pyrotechnics or anybody on set that knew anything about explosives or how to blow up anything. So we would get all these kids in a van and then throw in the crew and we're all hot and sweaty and we're going down Texas highways at two miles an hour and someone goes to Ed here, the hitchhiker, and says, give me your hand. He puts some tin foil on it, puts a ton of ammunition and says, now in your next shot, all you gotta do is, you know, like this and uh, you know make a little poof and you know go with the scene and I said to the nice man have you done this before and he went oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> well you know you could have lost all of us that day because Ed blew us all up really big <laughs> we had four times as much gunpowder as we needed oh yeah <laughs> and so then Always going, going to, and I think we ought to use a little less. <laughs> yeah. And then we had to do it again, and this time we're wondering, how much does he have of that crap? Does he know what he's doing? Is he going to drop it? Are we going to catch fire? We were so scared if we looked like terrorized as the hitchhikers preparing to bomb us. It's because we, we thought he was. <laughs> Now, Alan, as you mentioned, um, your reaction to Gunner initially was uh, was legitimate. You were actually frightened, and based on some of the other stories we're hearing, that some of the injuries were real. <laughs> now, I'm starting to sense there's, there's a lot of realism in the movie. So, which leads me to you. And <laughs> Now that we've gotten to know you a little bit better, I needed the money, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> it doesn't seem like there was a whole lot of acting involved in your character. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> you, you, you play crazy very well. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. Um, I, well, okay. Was there, was there a lot of, uh, did you have to do a lot of no, no, you didn't. <laughs> you were just uh, being yourself. I just darker my street makeup and went right on. <laughs> well, your character is definitely. Uh, it was a lot of fun. It was actually based on my nephew, who is a legitimate, a paranoid schizophrenic. So I was just doing all the stuff he does. And then Toby gets a letter from some guy in the California Institute of whatever. Like, We're so glad you used a real person and gave them an opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> so they recognized all this stuff. And I'm like, I was really pissed off. At first I'm like, well, I get it. Okay, it's kind of a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> you talk about the mayhem on the set. Poor you. Yeah. I sure wish he was here, Jimmy C. Dow. Jimmy C. Dow was one of the greatest people. He was the sweetest, gentlest person that you're ever going to meet. And here he was, supposed to be this 
maniacal, psychotic killer, you know. Yep, he had to get a sandwich. You know, he was a sweet, <laughs> but uh, low budget movie making, right? They were supposed to, uh, uh, he was supposed to poke at me with a little thing here and get me, uh, to straighten me up. And so low budget movie making, <laughs> anybody got a prop? And they're looking around for a prop and they go, oh, here, hand this. And what they handed him was a dowel that they used to put the, the gaffers tape in. And uh, that they used different weights of tape for different things. And they neglected to realize that it's a very strong dowel <laughs> to hold all the rolls of tape that's made out of oak. Where he was oak. And it was supposed to be balsam. <laughs> and it was oak. <laughs> and, uh, they so poor Jimmy see that he takes this oak down. Yeah, it's kind of fun. Not really, it's oak! <laughs> and he's just beating the doo doo out of me. And you can hear Toby and the producer on the other side of the camera going, Gosh, it's doing a great today. <laughs> Those reactions, if I didn't know any better, I'd swear to God they were real. <laughs> I think we're going to have to give him an extra sandwich a week. <laughs> Just really good. I don't even think we'll need to take this. Oh, we can't take it again. He's passing out. <laughs> From the Hulk! <laughs> okay, I think we have a question all the way in the back. When you do a remake movie, and people are talking about the 2003 edition, why not use the exact same cast from the new, from the original one? Because that way, when the remake happens, it's not just making money for your franchise, it's actually making money for you and the franchise. Yes. What a novel idea. I know. <laughs> Stand up. Yeah. You know, you want to tackle that? <laughs> I'm forbidden by my, my counselor to speak like this. <laughs> the reason they don't is it's a guy in a mask for other things. And that's their whole attitude. It's just a guy in a mask. So whoever we can get that we pay the least money for, that's who we'll get. And that's, that's primarily the attitude. I think often uh, what they think, what they understand is a sequel or remake will, is guaranteed, unless it's totally incompetent. It's essentially guaranteed to make about 60% of the gross of the previous movie. So why go to much effort if they know they're going to make X millions of dollars? If we have to pay him a little extra, well, that's money out of my pocket. And I think that's generally the attitude. It's not always the attitude. But, you know, and I think with Chainsaw 3D, the nice thing was that they actually brought three of us from the original movie. And I was surprised as could be about that because the attitude has always been yeah, if, he's, well, if he wants to do it, you know, and, or the real attitude is, if, he, if he's grateful enough to do it. And that's, that's always been the attitude toward me when they've talked to me about doing it. You know, the attitude clearly was, you should be grateful we are being offered this part. In the remake, they actually offered me a different part, which is fine. You know, I just did that. Uh, but they acted like, First of all, they kept bypassing my agent, and they went directly to me. And they acted like I knew nothing about movies. I mean, nothing. And they said to me now, this time it's a dark psychological horror, not a bloodbath like the original. So of course I said, oh, have you ever seen the original? <laughs> but the attitude was, she said, we're being really secretive. Now, the character I had was the truck driver at the end. I got a couple of lines, or he doesn't. We're being really secretive about the script. But if, if you agree to be in the movie, I can arrange for you to get your pages. <laughs> now, I said, wow. <laughs> You're going to let me learn my lines and everything. <laughs> And I, but the other cue there to me was your pages. When she said that, it was clear to me that she assumed I knew nothing about the film business. Any actor will tell you that when you get those pages, they're giving you your sides. They're called sides, not pages. And for her to call them pages to me meant 
she assumed I was a total idiot. And that's basically the attitude, you know. Uh, and, and I think that's always been the attitude toward all of it.